Um, this is the panel called Amplifying Indigenous History, Reach, Reaching Audiences and Institutions. My name is Liz Covart. I'm a historian of early America and the founding director of Colonial Williamsburg's brand new Innovation Studios. Um, you may also know me from my work on the award-winning podcast called Ben Franklin's World, which pertinent to this panel has two new episodes out, um, which we worked with uh, the American Indian Initiative at Colonial Williamsburg to produce. Um, and it's two episodes about the history and legacy of the Brafferton Indian School told from Indigenous perspectives. And you can find that at benfranklinsworld.com. So this is an interdisciplinary panel of scholars and his public history practitioners, and they're going to share information about their work to recover and restore indigenous histories and how we share them among different institutions. So I'm going to start by introducing our three panelists. They're going to give um, 12 to 15 minute presentations, and then we're going to hope it up to what I think will be a really great qu uh, question and answer session discussion. So our panelists include Kelly Berry. Kelly Berry is an enrolled citizen of the Apache tribe of Oklahoma with, affili with affiliations to the Kiowa, Southern Cheyenne, and Choctaw nations. Kelly is a second year doctoral student in education leadership at Kansas State University, where he is a full-time Indigenous Initiatives Research Associate in the College of Education. He also serves as a co-instructor for Kansas State's newly developed Indigenous Education Leadership Certificate Graduate Program. And Kelly was recently named a University Council for Educational Administration, Barbara L. Jackson Scholar. So congratulations, Kelly, that's wonderful. Our second presenter is Dr. Danielle Moretti Langholz, and she is the Tom Thomasina E. Jordan Director of the American Indian Resource Center in the Department of Anthropology at William and Mary. As a cultural anthropologist, she is the administrator of the Interdisciplinary Native Studies minor and teaches a wide variety of courses on Indigenous history and culture. Dr. Moretti Langholtz's research focuses on the political resurgence of Virginia's seven federally recognized tribes and four state recognized tribes. Her most recent work, the edited volume, Building the Brafferton, the founding, funding, and legacy of America's Indian School, was the outcome of more than a decade of research about the interaction between the Native Nations and the College of William & Mary. Dr. Moretti Langholtz is also the curator of Native American art at William & Ma William Mary's Muscarelle Museum of Art. And our third panelist is Lawrence A. Gunmore III, a citizen of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, a state-recognized Indian tribe in North Carolina. He is a descendant of the Saponi, Okanichi, Tutelo, and related Eastern Siouan-speaking tribes that inhabited the Piedmont regions of Virginia and North Carolina in pre-Columbian times, and that later combined as one community at Fort Christana under the Treaty of 1713 with the colony of Virginia. He has served in various positions of the Okanichi, I'm sorry, on the Okanichi Saponi Tribal Council as a chairperson, vice chairperson, and continues to work to preserve Eastern Siouan culture, history, and folklore, and the Tutelo Saponi language as a tribal historian and folklorist. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Berry. Where's that? I'm just going to start. Yeah, you're going to go. And what's up there? Okay. Yeah. All right, so good morning. Uh, as Liz said, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to step away from the podium a little because I'm an instructor. And can you hear me if I use the, my teacher voice? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, so this is a thanks to the uh, organization for inviting me myself out to present today. Um, so I'll let you read that. I'm going to read word for word. Okay. So as Liz mentioned, I'm at Kansas State University, a second-year doctoral student. I actually graduate in July of next year, so I'm happy about that with my doctor of education. So, uh, so there's my title. When I was asked to present... They gave me a title that said Amplifying Indigenous Histories. But I had to think about what that meant because I cannot teach you about Indigenous history in one day. If you ask me, you'd say, Kelly, can you teach about the 574 fairly recognized tribes? That'll take all year. If, I, if you ask me to teach about the state recognized tribes, that'll take you half a year. So I had to really think about what I wanted to choose in my research. Now, this is part of my research. This is not my dissertation. My dissertation is esports and education. I'm a gamer, so I like to do a game. But this is part of my research because this is what I know, because I have a connection to this. 
And before we start, I'm going to let you know that when I teach or give presentations, I'm very interactive. So I'm going to ask you questions today, and I might give up gift cards today. You've got to get everything correct, okay? So there's no half answers today. So here's my positionality to boarding schools. I am a direct descendant of boarding school survivors. Uh, my grandparents, I'll show you where they went. Great grandfather went to Carlisle Industrial School in Pennsylvania, and my great grandmother went to Rainy Mountain Indian School in Southwest Oklahoma. Now, you know, see anything about those sentences? Those two sentences about my grandparents. You know anything? See, see, see anything? Ah, yes. I didn't say attended. I know a lot of people, a lot of my colleagues like to say, well, they attended. I don't. Because the students that went to these boarding schools during the federal board era are the only students that we refer to as survivors and not graduates. If you survived, you came home. A lot of our children did not come home, so that's why we refer to them as survivors. So I wanted to unpack that real quick before we go on. Does that make sense? Okay. And then also, my father and I both served as faculty at Riverside Indian School, which is still operational today as a boarding school. How many knew we still have boarding schools in operation today? Half and half. Okay. Yes, we do. We have a certain amount, and we'll talk about those later on. All right, so here's your first uh, gift card. Try right here. So I'm gonna put something over here. You've got to translate it. And we'll talk about it after I do that. So I need you to translate that. <laughs> I see a lot of people writing writing down, right? Writing notes. It's a language. So try to try to translate it. Try to write it down. Think about it and we'll talk about it here in a minute. Okay. Everybody got that translated? How many says yes? I've got it translated. I don't see nobody. I'm trying to give away gift cards here, guys. <laughs> okay, so here's the next one. Think about why I'm putting this up here like this. What I'm doing today in this presentation, I'm telling you the boarding school experience from my perspective, my cultural perspective, which we don't talk about in schools. Do we, classroom? We always say it from the Bureau of Secrets point of view, right? We never hear about the cultural indigenous perspective. And this is what I'm doing right here. Does everybody have an idea about why I'm putting this up here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Last one to translate. All right. So I have a $10 gift card. Who's got the, every transaction line? Okay. I see one person was over here. Right there. They I'm, just there. Gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to take a guess. I don't know. I guess I don't. Like, are they different um, conceptualizations or translations of something like Every Child Matters? Like, is it a translation of something like that? Could be. What is it? What is it? What do you think? What do you think? Well, I think that's I don't know the means and chance. It could be. Ah. It could be that this is if you were a boarding school student being forced to learn English, this is what English looks like. How many have seen this TV show? So. If you haven't seen the third season, the third and final season of other reflection dogs, it, it portrays indigenous life in a town. Okay. So one of the uh, episodes of season three deals with boarding schools. And they kept, they took two little Indian boys to the boarding school. And they would hear this when they were there. But it sounded like gibberish. So when I first put this up there, what did y'all think it sounded like? What did you try to imagine it sounded like? Is it Okay. So I'm gonna tell a story real quick. I like to tell stories that are relevant. So I was watching that episode with my brother, and if you haven't seen the episode, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ruin it for you. Okay? <laughs> so my apologies for that. So during the episode, the two little Indian boys are at the school, and off screen you hear a voice. You hear a voice, but it's a strange voice. And then when I heard it, I asked my brother. I said, "What are goose talking?" And everybody knows what I'm referring to. It's in the episode, okay? And so it keeps on going. Off screen, you hear this voice like this, but it, I can't make it out. And I asked my brother, I said, what, what are you making that sound? Who's talking? Come to find out, it's the nuns talking. They're talking in English. And the little boys are hearing Jewish. And I asked my brother, is that what it sounds like? And he said, I think so. Even as a native person, in the great center of boarding schools, I did not know that's what it sounded like gibberish. So that's what we're hearing. This is not taught in school. How many of you have seen teachers or instructors teach this way? 
What I'm doing now is I'm privileging the cultural aspect. I'm privileging our voice. And that's what's not seen to sort of that. So when I keep training teachers, I train teachers how to use indigenous history and platform. And one of the first things I asked them, I was like, when they reached out, they said, Kelly, can you help me add culture to the classroom? First question I asked is, what do you want to teach? Well, I want to teach indigenous history. My second question, what do you want to teach? Well, I want to teach indigenous history. And so I rattled off like 50 different things about indigenous, indigenous history. Then I asked them again, what do you want to teach? And they said, because they, don't, they didn't know that it encompasses so much of our history. It takes years to learn our history. And I don't say I'm culturally competent. Yes, I'm Native American, but I don't say I'm culturally competent because I cannot teach about the Okanuki tribe. I cannot teach about the state tribe or tribal sovereignty as much as I can. So I say I'm culturally knowledgeable about my tribe, the Apache tribe in Kiowa. So if you ever hear somebody saying they're culturally competent about the Native American culture, they're lying to you. They're lying. So I could spend all day telling you about the culture, but I wanted to talk about an aspect of our culture that ties across every tribe here in America and Canada. Okay? You've all seen the news stories about bodies and graves being found on boarding school campuses. Yeah, we could talk about that, but I want to make sure that when I train teachers, they understand that when you teach about boarding schools, you cannot teach just solely about the federal Indian boarding school era, which is 1819 to 1956. You have to talk about every era of the boarding schools. Now, why do you think teachers don't talk about this era and their associated problems? Why? Why don't we talk about this era? Yeah. A lot of them don't know that this era exists. Don't know? Yeah, that's exactly. What's another reason? Yeah. It's not easy history. Not easy history? What else? There's one glaring aspect of why we don't teach this in social studies class. Look at the dates. Do we consider this part of United States history? No. No. So a lot of my colleagues, and sadly to say, a lot of my Native colleagues are incognizant of this era right here. When I came out here two years ago, last year, to, I went back and I told my colleagues, one of my colleagues said, he's an indigenous scholar, talks about border school all day long. I said, well, why don't we talk about the draft things back? What's the draft? <laughs> he didn't even know. He's published on board school. He didn't even know what's it. Is that sad? Yeah, it's sad. So here it is. One of my colleagues who's got 20 years on me, he's hindered. He's my mentee. Because I'm teaching about the colonial Indian schools, which there's only about four that are really stand out. So we know about the Brafferton. Somebody give me another one that colonial Indian schools that are kind of well known. I was looking for there's three more. So what do you think? Let's know. Yes. What was it called before? Uh, was it affiliated or Wheelock? Yeah, Wheelock. Yeah. So we have Dartmouth, but that wasn't called back to colonial. Dartmouth wasn't the name we used during the colonial period. You might know what that is. Not Wheelock. What is it? <laughs> I'm not sure. What we're about. Yeah. It's not Wheelock. Charity. Morris Charity Indian School. So I don't know if it's in order, but I'm going to show you the next one. So we know about this, right? This is an operational. Okay. And I think we have the next one is we know this one, right? And then we have Morris Charity Indian School, which is a prelude to Dartmouth University. Now we get to the part where I amaze a lot of my colleagues, especially Native colleagues, because they have no clue about these and these other things. Why? Because it's not well known. You know, I took pictures of the Brampton last yesterday and day before last year. And when I showed my colleagues that they said, what building is that showing? I said, it's the Bradford It's the second oldest Indian school in America. Really? That's their answer right there. So how do you teach about boarding schools and not teach about this era? It makes no sense. You're doing a disservice to the classroom, right? Because you have to get the full knowledge, the full history. Okay? Now, keep in mind, this era, and my colleague is going to talk about the graphic too. I'll leave some stuff out. And I think that she stole some information from me. So, <laughs> uh, but keep in mind, this era of boarding schools is unlike the next era. They weren't forced to go to school here, they were encouraged to go to school. 
by the English. And at first, just like always, the native people were skeptical of the government, just like we are today. So it took a while, but they they they, they, they sent their students here. And it was a form of cultural brokerage. They wanted them to learn the English language, the mannerisms, so they could take it back to the tribe and have change in there. And we'll talk about that cultural brokerage in a minute, because I have a story about that as it relates to my family. Okay? So just keep in mind that these were not like the next era. The next era, the federal boarding survival school era, is really when you get to the harsh story, right? And then you have to throw in these schools. These schools weren't part of the colonial schools. They weren't part of the federal boarding schools. What are these schools right here? How many have heard of this school? Yeah? What do you know about? It started by American Indian tribe, and it became uh, Pembroke, right? UNC Pembroke. So this is a prelude to UNC Pembroke. This is a tribally controlled boarding school, which doesn't fall in those errors we still have to talk about because they're part of history. Okay. How many has already learned something today? As when I teach, that's what I always ask my students, and I always tell them, if you take away one thing that I've done my job, if you can take one piece of information I've taught you and use that Walmart in a conversation, I've done my job. <laughs> and I'll just throw this one because it's part of the process too. How many know about the problem at the beginning of the school? Two? So you have to see the pattern here. You have to talk about this. If you have a teacher instructor telling you just one part of boarding school history, then they're, they're not doing a good job. I could spend all day talking about this, and I would love to, but I got probably what five minutes. And then we move on to where my grandparents get involved. This is the federal boarding initiative map that came out. Uh, my colleague actually worked for the department here, and he actually worked on the Federal Boarding School Initiative. And how many boarding schools do we have? 18, 19, 1956. How many boarding schools do we have there? What do you think? Another gift card. <laughs> Count them up. <laughs> 400, but what? 400, what? Eight. 408 boarding schools. Here in the, 40, the federal boarding survivor era is what I call it. I call it the federal boarding survivor era. Not the boarding schools, but a lot of my colleagues will push back. That's fine. But we all have different interpretations of what this era means. Okay, for me, it's about going, coming home. Can you imagine spending days on a train going to some other state that has a boarding school and you didn't know what was going on or where you're going? And sadly to say, hundreds of thousands didn't come home. And you see that on the news every day. Okay. So this is my great-grandfather's ID card from Carlisle Indian School, 1898. We found it at Carlisle Indian School. So you can see this is how they were identified. We have actually have another copy of it, and it says he's a different tribe, but the very name, which is my last name, his name, it's actually a boarding school name. I am not supposed to be a berry. I'm supposed to be, my last name is supposed to be Fossey Paul, but it got changed during boarding school. So, berry is my colonized name or white name, however you want to say it. A lot of names got changed, okay? But here's the thing though when you're talking to boarding school survivors, here's my advice never ask them about their experience. Never ask. Let them tell you, okay? We only have one quote attributed to my great grandfather of his time during boarding school. He never said anything but one quote. And this is his only quote that we can find about his experiences. He got pushed or forced onto a train in Oklahoma, and he got sent to Carlisle, Indian School, in Pennsylvania. And he said it was the longest child of the train ride of his life. And that's the only thing we went. I didn't ask. My father didn't ask. Nobody asked him about experiences. Some people will tell you. And if you hear the stories about the Federal Board Initiative, school initiative that Deb Holland is currently doing, she went to different boarding schools right now. And they had a lot of survivors tell their stories. It was full of, and I'll say it, it was full of violence, full of whippings and beatings, and full of rapes. That's their, that's their story. Some survived, some didn't. 
So look up here. Look at number 15, number 15 and the line, the words. Look at number 15. See number 15? See my great grandfather's name? So you see what it says next to it? Interpret it. At Carlisle, he learned the white language. When he came back, these are the chiefs. So you got some interpreters, you got some chiefs. This was taken right before they left Washington, D.C. to meet in Congress. When he came back from boarding school, the chiefs told him, you're going to serve as an interpreter because we can't speak English. So for, from that point on, from boarding school, he was acting as an interpreter for the Apache tribe of Oklahoma. And that's what we talked about with the colonial schools, that cultural brokerage. They learned how to be interpreters or translators or cultural brokers for their tribe. And that's what the whole goal of the colonial media school was, to change and change your tribe for the better. But the boarding school era was a little bit different. So this, we found this, this is uh, in the um, National Archives somewhere. But this is what I wanted to show you my relation to what we're talking about boarding schools. They serve as interpreters, a lot of interpreters. There's three up here by name. So that was my experience from my direct connection to my grandfather. And then we have the repurpose in the schools of today. Now, let me pack the repurpose. Okay, let me unpack that. Repurpose means today we don't have boarding schools taught by the nuns. We don't have boarding schools taught by priests. Who do we have boarding schools taught by today? Native people. Native people. I don't think our ancestors, my ancestors, though, those colonial schools or the federal boarding schools, thought that the boarding schools of today would have native teachers teaching native students. To me, that's amazing because that's not what boarding schools are made for. They weren't made for native teachers to teach there. They were made for native students to be assimilated, to have cultural genocide forced upon them left and right. So before I go on, any questions so far? Any thoughts so far? Yes. I'm just kind of wondering about the dates because I hear different dates all the time for yeah. the boarding school era. Yeah. And I, you know, then you saw the BIA report and they found some schools are open as early as like 1808, 1806. But then I've seen records of some of our schools like from Oklahoma that were open until the 1980s. And so why, why all these different date ranges? Is there a date range that we can all kind of quote that's maybe a little more accurate and what would we base that number on? Is it based on the funding sources? Is it based on the intention? Is it based on who's teaching it? Like, what are, how are we crafting the parentheses for this period? I'll refer to my colleague, which is the, the part of here, you're working on that report. So, dictated by federal policy and time periods. I mean, I, I think the, uh, the, the original volume one of the report focused around 1821 forward. So there's been a debate about whether, how far back and understand that the initial volume specifically deals with the federal government. It's not dealing with uh, religious institutions, public organizations, uh, which we all know were deeply involved in the boarding school movement. So that's future work. I yeah. mean, it's a lot of work ahead so, to be done. I say 1819, 1956, but there's different interpretations of when. So your preference. So. And so, one of the things I was asked to do about this presentation, yes. Sorry, yeah, um, yeah, about yeah, your yeah, previous yeah. slide. Yeah. I'm curious what the impact has been, like, communally and culturally, in reclaiming these spaces that were previously um, sites of genocide and horror. So, uh, having taught in Riverside Indian School for two years before I made my way to Kansas State University, uh, down the hallways, there's a feeling of dread. There's a feeling of heaviness still there, and. I'll say this about a lot of the colleagues that teach there and teach other boarding schools right now. We're still facing simulation in the classroom that these modern day and repurpose boarding schools because how many teachers are out there? How many teachers? Okay. Y'all, y'all went through a teacher training program? Yeah. Did they teach how to put folks in the classroom? Did they teach a training program to teach how to put folks in the classroom? Yeah. So a lot of my colleagues went through the Eurocentric teaching credit programs. So they're still teaching a form of simulation. So I when I was there, I was helping system for culture classroom like this. So there's still a feeling of trauma. We had a lot of uh, grandparents that didn't want their students to come to Riverside because they had personal experiences there. So um, we talked about the beatings and stuff. So still a dread. We still live in that thinking that every boarding school is going to steal our name, 
you know, healers and rapists, that's what we're still dealing with. So even though it's been gone, I mean, we still have native teachers. Teachers are still there. So that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. Almost. All right. So one of the um, questions I was asked, dude, how do we disseminate this information? Okay. We have a lot of um, people doing different things. So like my brother, last time, he goes out to the community. If you were, if you heard, heard this presentation last time, it was good. The both of them were great. Everybody was good. And so he goes out to the community and he teaches culture in the community, right? What you do? Okay. So my action is to in the classroom. So. K State has, we're in a third cohort, and we have this Indigenous Education and Leadership Graduate Program. And it's a 12 credit hour, and we have four classes. And the first class is called Fundamental, Fundamentals of Histories of Indig Indigenous Education. And I teach that, I co teach that with one of my colleagues. Part of that class is I teach all this stuff about boarding schools in that class. Okay? The other courses deal with federal sovereignty, tribal sovereignty, funding revenue, funding streams. I know my limitations about being a teacher, about being knowledgeable about this stuff. So I don't teach those other courses that everybody else do. A lot of people, other people do. So this is how we're disseminating information to the public to institution is through classwork right here. We're training our leaders and students in classroom to work in various capacities of Indian education of Indian country. So that's what we're doing at okay, say so we graduated uh 24 students so far that work in various stages of Indian education in Indian country. So we're doing well. So if you know anybody, it's not just natives. We don't just recruit natives. It's open to everybody. So if anybody wants to learn about Indian education, Indian policy, directly for us. And we will train them to work in those capacities. So that's how we're doing K State. All right. So um, I'll, I'll pass this all out, all the leaks and everything. So, but I will leave you, leave you on this. Well, first of all, do I owe anybody good books? <laughs> One, okay, I got you, I got you, I got you. Uh, so I'll leave you with this. It's a sad history. I understand that. But there's also positive. There's also confusion about boarding school and education. But if you teach boarding schools, if you teach art history, make sure you make space. Make sure you privilege our voices. Make sure you privilege our stories and our perspectives. Because what you heard today, what you see today, we have a lot to tell, right? But it's just not, we're not always heard. So thank you. Right. Really help me out. Yep, I got it. Thank you uh, for the invitation to speak today. I think these are yours. Thank you. The invitation, and by the way, it's nice to see both of these gentlemen again, who I know uh, previously. Um, no, no, yeah. so, there I am. <laughs> She's my TA, my grad student. <laughs> make her work. Um, I was asked to talk about amplification of indigenous voice in an institutional setting. So I'm from William and Mary, and this presentation is about going back and looking at our boarding school history. And first thing I want to say is this magnificent building here. 1723 is the completion date for the building. This, this school was up and running before that time. Do you notice the date? There's a lot of interest in this, the 300th anniversary of the school. And we, until recently, until the research that I, my uh, graduate students and other scholars working with me did, no new information about this school for decades. Nothing. Everything was, we, we know this history, we know all about it. There's nothing new. And most importantly, the history <coughs> didn't add up to anything, except didn't amount to much. It was a failure, whatever failure meant. So... My office is not far from this building. I've seen it every day for years. And you're kind of puzzled about why such a magnificent building has uh, little, in, little 
impact or, or connection to Native history. And slowly that began to change through my interaction with Native people. So I don't have time to go into that background story, but let's um, consider what happens. So I use the concept in talking about this as received history. We all have our institutions, be they universities, museums, other things, have a received history about who they are and what they do. So the received history of the Bradford and Indian School was pretty well entrenched until a few things started to happen. I've already mentioned it was a failed enterprise. Um, we can't do any more. And we're a prominent university that teaches history. It's one of our strongest disciplines. See, you don't, I'm a cultural anthropologist. Do you go up against that? Some things started to happen. Um, and then, then you're told, well, there's this fragmentary evidence. Okay, so when you're dealing with the 18th century, you don't necessarily have everything that you need. But anthropologists, I will say, are pretty good at taking pieces of things and bringing them together and saying, I see what's missing here. I can reconstruct that. Let me look here. Let me go elsewhere. Importantly, let me go back to all of those original sources wearing my anthropology glasses. That took, I, I say, a decade online, just more, longer than that. Self-funded with dedicated students, both sides of the Atlantic, let's go. Let's go to this archive. Let's go to Bradford in England. We found out so many things had been confused and cemented into a presentation about the Bradford and Indian School that amplified the architecture of the building, that amplified the Georgian buildings and the importance of three historic buildings. Amplification of native voice, zero, zero. So it was that the volume was turned off. And we thought, what if we go back? You don't know what you're gonna find. So we went back, this is just an example of the kinds of things we looked at, maps documents from the era, our own charter, which interestingly puts the uh, effort to establish an Indian school right with the founding of the school. So that led us down a whole nother path. And why, why is that there? Why is that there? Maybe in the Q&A we would have time for what I think. As an anthropologist also, I'm interested in reinserting storylines and narratives into a larger, larger story. What's the large story of Williamsburg in the 18th century? It's a node, important node of transatlantic connections. Oh, all of a sudden you bring in these documents about the Indian school, fragmentary documents, rich documents that pertain to following the money. There are always documents about finances. So we started there. How is the school financed? And sometimes when you're in the work, you get lucky. Or maybe as my academic advisor used to say, serendipitous things happen. So for years, I have been looking for a map. You see it here hand-drawn map of the Bradford Estate in England. How, why was I looking for it? I found a note, I found a letter that referenced the map. It said the map had been brought to Williamsburg. Great things happen sometimes when you work with terrific people at William & Mary. They found it on a shelf. Do you ever have time in your house where you put something down, you, you can't find it again? Years like, oh, here it is. Had never been accessioned. Why is it important? It really pertains to the funding of the school. This tells us why it's called the Bradford Inn. There's a Bradford Inn estate in England that was purchased by the heirs and the executors of the will of Robert Boyle with the intent that the money would support an Indian school for the purpose of religious education. That's a whole nother line. So if you think of these 
lines that come into this story about ecclesiastical networks, who's on the ground in Williamsburg, how are they associated with Boyle? It's all a lot of work that has to be brought together and put together. But following the money, back to the India School was an interesting thing. And here's just an example of the kinds of documents that we found. So if you're going to go to an institution and you're going to say, I'd like to discuss what you think you know about this history. You really shouldn't go and say, you know, you're all wrong about this. Mm -hmm. You've got to go rather carefully and say, I'd like to share what I have found <clears throat> after 10 years and with students. And it really situates this school in a very different place. It's got to be evidence-based. You can't just say, I've got an idea and I'm really passionate about this and I'm really going to denounce this. And, no, what's the evidence, Professor? Well, let me show you the evidence. Let me show you. So you bring the evidence and I organized it, the argument that we had, maybe not, I think today is a good day, this word amplification, totally turned down that knob about native voice. I, I organized everything that I could find into three sections. The founding of the school, the funding, rich sources of data, and the legacy of the school. So what's the order then of bringing this evidence forward to amplify native voice and change the perspective of an institution that's the second oldest university in the United States that really prides itself on tradition and its colonial past as well. I decided to do it visually, knowing my colleagues that they would be interested in my argument. But doing it visually, I took two years to plan an exhibition that ran on our campus in the then museum with the objects, with the evidence, with the actual documents. Took me several years to pull it together, the real thing. No replicas, including even in the portraits. And unpacked the story visually, including with the names of the people I could find in three galleries with their names of the students up and brought in different tribes, including from around the United States, because we began to see my students and I began to see the impact of this school over time and the displacement of tribes to the West out of Virginia meant that there were affiliated tribes with our school in many places of the United States today, particularly out towards as far, well, even as far as Oklahoma, Kelly. So, what I have skipped a, a bit here, and then you see you see maps, you see portraits, you see objects, bringing the evidence forward to say we need to change the voice. As part of this, I also decided to go out specifically to four groups, four groups that I could find documented evidence, back to evidence base a signature of a Bradford and student, a document written by a Bradford and student and go back to four communities, say, may we talk? Can we talk about this history and your community's place at this school? The reception was quite extraordinary. Um, not only did people listen, communities listen, but a number of communities said, you know, we had a store at, yeah, yeah, we think we used to be there. Yeah, they were very much focused on, yeah, no, we've had no connection with you for a couple hundred years, but nice to see you today. We think we used to be with you. And I asked each of them, I raised money, the Muscarelli Museum of Art was generous in giving me money. That's the only funds I had for any of this research. Everything was self-generated funds because we didn't know what we were going to find. And I said, would you make, and I'll show you, make a response from your community about this school and your community's experience with it. And I, I, I will show you those responses, and I had no idea what was going to come. 
Uh, this, these next two slides show the names that we have gathered in association with the school. And I want to note that it starts, first references I could find, no, 1702. You know, two decades before the building is open on the school. And notice the, the amount of students. Of course, that received history was, you know, there weren't very many students, weren't very many Native students. I'm thinking, what are you thinking? It's William and Mary today with five, 6,000 students. How many students would there have been at William and Mary in 1702? Not very many. How about 1723? 1712. Notice 1712, I have 24 Native students. How many students? 40 non-Native students. Notice the percentages there. All of a sudden, that building now has a different weight on the campus. It's substantive. And it signals, I use the word, a silent uh, a sentinel of British policy putting it back in, putting the Bradford in and Native groups back into the transatlantic world. What is the British trying to do? Hold, hold this pit space in North America for their colonial enterprise. Who do they need to do that? They need to be allied with some tribes. Who is sending students, these tribes, who are allied with the British at this time? And they're boys until we get to, to the, the end of the, the era. Boys, because, Kelly, kids learn English easier than adults. If any of us in this room want to be a new language learner, it's harder when you're older. But kids, two at a time, and the, the highlighted names in, in bold are the ones that actually found the document with the signature or an important reference to a student. This was really critical to me because that received history said, Things like, I'm not even going to name the scholars who wrote that, the famous scholars. We don't even have evidence that they learned how to write. I thought that's really a pejorative term. Not only that I know, I can find the documents. They're serving as translators for their tribes and later for the Americans during the revolution. Stories that are shocking. But then we see this fade off. You know, we're here in Williamsburg. We're interested in the revolution. We see this thinning out as the revolution comes close. And the Indians sort of like, I think we're out of here. What's going on? So I will end to show you um, what native response I got. So in a way, these objects of expressive culture are in fact native voice in a material form. Not a ways, I didn't know what was gonna happen. A wampum belt, a very traditional Iroquoian concept. I was given the honor to name this piece. I named it Path to the Bradford, and you can clearly see the outline of the building. Two forms, human forms. We said two students always together. They have encoded that memory in this piece. William and Mary Indians by Kevin Brown, a good friend of mine. He was chief at this time. And in here, if you can see, he, he asked for documents. So Danielle, give me documents. Give me the copy of the charter. I'm gonna, yeah, Pamunkeys were at the school more than any other tribe. And he's saying our community is, is mixed in, our history is mixed with this. This one, I'm gonna have this basket out for a talk I'm giving on November 14th, the late Shan Goshorn. Notice what she's done, a Cherokee base. Laying the foundation, the Cherokee base, if you look closely, she has woven this basket with images of the Bradford and Indian School, names of students the, on the inside. The back is completely different. And Shan came here, spent three days with me, and came and said, you know, I'm really going to be creating something, and I'm really anti-boarding schools. I said, okay, here's, we said, let me see your research. Let me go through it. As the day went by and the next day, she said, this is a different kind of thing. We don't know about this. We were important then, important to the British. I, I have to think about it. I sent her PDFs 
and she printed them on splints and magically created an incredible work. Richard's saying Smith, Wyandotte, et cetera. More recent piece by uh, Denise Wallace of the Nottaway. And I love this story quilt because we see the Bradford and students as boys. They're boys and they're acting like boys outside in this, uh, this other world. So what do we do with this? I'm still waiting. I'm not going to go over this because uh, Kelly did this. I was going to talk about Hampton and the Carlisle Indian School. But now we have an opportunity for a new legacy or to move the this amplifying indigenous voice, new research, evidence-based, not just emotion-based. Evidence-based, what should we be doing? How do we see co-constitutive relationships around a native place that was more than William and Mary campus, but the entire uh, continent? So I'll just end here, say this is a work in progress. We have many more uh, aspects of this that we're working on, and uh, it's not easy. Yes, easy to raise the voice. You don't want a cacophony of screaming voices. You want to amplify a voice so that you get their perspective and a change and a way forward. Thank you very much. This is this coming up here. Oh, it's the wrong one. Come on up, Lawrence. Witahese, Meku, Enegu, Meyahewa, Eonamal Hinpa, Wa Okinichi Sopone Watakai. Greetings, everybody. Greetings, friends. I am Lawrence Dunmore of the Okinichi Sopone people, and I am glad to be here. I'm honored. Thank you, William and Mary, Rev Ed, Omohindro Institute, for allowing us to be here today to share a little bit of our culture and history. Just so you'll know, this presentation is going to be in two parts, and I'm going to try and go through it, a lot of information, but I thought it was important to share this with you. Um, the first part will deal with um, how, and this is for, for, uniquely to the Okanichi, um, how we have developed relationships with um, uh, historical and educational institutions in North Carolina, the successes, lessons learned, things I thought might be helpful and useful to share. And if time allows, I want to share a little information from our history in terms of the Revolutionary War, a little brief overview of some of the experiences of a smaller Native community, which you really don't hear much about. You know, we hear about the Cherokee, the Catawba, the Six Nations, but you don't really know much about what happened to the smaller community. So I'm going to give you a little insight, a little background, a little taste of what it was like in 1760s, 1770s around the Virginia North Carolina border area for our little, you know, uh, settled communities of Sioux speaking people. So let's go forth. Man, as soon as I figure out how to do this. <laughs> Here's some pictures from our community just to show you a little taste. Uh, positionality. Um, I'll be representing uh, some of the strategies for building mutually beneficial relationships with state, local, regional, educational, and historical institutions as utilized by the Okanichi Band of Saponi Nation, or OBSN for short. Uh, this presentation comes from a Native perspective. Make, it may be contrary in some places to popular scholarly interpretation. The presentation contains historical facts which are common to all descendants of the historic Saponi Nation of Indians. However, the primary focus today is going to be on, uh, in terms of the Revolutionary War, a history on the Saponi descendants who migrated from Brunswick and Greensville County of Virginia and Northampton County, North Carolina, to Orange, Alamance, and Caswell Counties, North Carolina, and their diaspora. 
that I'm here today to present our story to, to you is a testament to my ancestors' perseverance, sacrifice, and survival. <laughs> Introductions, I did not. <laughs> so let's begin. What are some motivations? We're talking about building mutually uh, beneficial relationships with institutions. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, what was the motivation of the Oak Nation to do that? Since the middle of the 20th century, many indigenous communities in the mid-Atlantic and southeastern regions of the United States undertook efforts to achieve recognized tribal status on the federal and state levels. As these communities performed the research necessary to prepare documented petitions, opportunities arose to examine the current historical information regarding their own unique histories. <coughs> many took advantage of these opportunities to update or correct the historic record. When the Okanichi Band, uh, Spoon Nation successfully underwent state tribal recognition uh, process in North Carolina, it became apparent that there was a general lack of knowledge regarding the history of the Okanichi Saponi and other surviving indigenous communities in North Carolina. This was especially evident in our local area of Alamance, Orange, and Caswell counties. Our objectives. What historical or educational materials that did exist usually address larger, better known indigenous communities or tribes, such as the Catawba Nation, Cherokee Nation, Cherokee, Eastern Band, Tuscarora, or the Six Nations Iroquois. Um, much of the historical information and discussions regarding Native peoples during the 17th and 18th centuries focus exclusively on these larger populations. The OBC, OBSN felt that our key objective was to document our unique culture and history so that we could educate the Okanichi Saponi community and the public from our perspective. In other words, we wanted to tell our own story. Research at state, local, federal facilities and archives began in earnest in the 1980s and has been ongoing and going. The research has been cultural and historical in nature and has involved efforts to recover and reintroduce the indigenous language of the community to Los Saponi. Some of our goals. To achieve our objectives, the tribe has kept several goals in mind. To educate our people and the public about our unique history. To perform thorough research to document our history. Develop historically accurate and supported tribal educational materials. Sharing the results of our research in a scholarly and professional manner. And telling our own history from our own point of view, even when it may contradict established academic interpretation. <laughs> or historical precedent, and developing and nurturing mutually respectful and beneficial relationships with local, state, and regional educational and historical institutions. Let's talk about some of the things that we've done in Orange and Alamance and Caswell counties. Um, one of the things we really looked at was, you know, how could we build these relationships? You know, fortunately, we were located in an area of North Carolina, uh, the Research Triangle, uh, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, which had a large number of um, uh, uh, college universities such as Duke University, you know, University, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And because of the historic nature of that region, towns like Hillsborough, one of the earliest capitals of the state, um, a center of activity in the colonial era, there has always been a keen interest in the colonial and early history. Um, and that also fortunately flowed to us, to the Native community and the Native histories. Many people don't know um, Hillsboro was built on the, basically it was based on Okanichi town. After the Okanichi um, were massacred and genocide was uh, performed on them by Nathaniel Bacon and his militia in 1676, um, by 1682, surviving members of the community who could no longer uh, sustain themselves on Okanichi Island on the Roanoke River migrated down the old trading path to settle on the Eno River near their Stukinok, Eno, and Shikori relatives. And the town they reestablished, Okanichi Town, became a trading town and uh, it was on the, 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 uh, the Great Trading Path and uh, basically became the basis later for the town of Hillsboro, North Carolina. So there's been a real keen interest that was to our benefit. Not all communities have that kind of benefit to them. So we were fortunately to have that. And we were able to tie in to people who had an interest in learning about the Okanichi. And they may have read about Okanichi Town or they were familiar with some of the archaeological excavations performed by the research laboratories of anthropology, later archaeology by UNC Chapel Hill. And 
at that time, there was a, a real current of activism within the community in the, in the 70s and 80s to try and, and reaffirm who we were, seeking recognition. And it all came together in a wonderful mix and allowed us to work with them because of the mutual interest uh, to, to both learn about who we were and to educate ourselves and the public. As time progressed, we began to make establish ties with um, historic institutions and organizations in Alamance, Orange, Caswell counties. Um, some of the organizations which we work closely with and still work closely with are the Alliance for Historic Hillsboro, the Orange County Museum. Um, they, uh, being in Hillsboro, have had a keen interest, as I mentioned. Um, and in addition, as part of our work and uh, cooperation with the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill um, and the actual work with the excavation of Okadichi Town, uh, in conjunction with them, we, we have rebuilt the original uh, Okadichi Town to scale in Hillsboro. It's a work in progress, but they actually mapped it out and the, the whole the portholes for the, are, are laid out just as it was in Okanichi Town. So if you go to North Hillsboro right now and you see the Palisade, you can actually walk in and you're seeing the actual size that the village would have been in 1680, 1685, 1690. So like I said, it's a work in progress and we do certain act historical activities, reenactments, um, and interpretations there, but it's something we're very proud of. I and mean, we've worked in conjunction with UNC Chapel Hill and Orange County to, in a very cooperative relationship um, to educate ourselves and the public. Um, local history is uniquely tied to Okanichi, as I said, and related tribes as we're in Okanichi town. And the keen interest to learn about the local native population has been there and is growing. One venue and avenue which we have taken advantage of and worked in cooperation with the local institutions and, and, and universities in the era is historical and cultural presentations. Um, you know, we have uh, our website, and, you know, we and on site at the uh, Tribal Center. Uh, our community um, is formerly called Little Texas, uh, our Texas community is located on uh, the border of Orange and Alamance County. Uh, most of it's in Northwest Alamance County now. But which was would have been a, a days long, a long days ride from Hillsboro back in the day. Um, but we have a lot of activities there. Uh, we have also rebuilt a village on site in Hillsboro. I'm, I mean, sorry, in Pleasant Grove. So we have two villages where we kind of do work from, and we do living interpretations there as well. Um, ways that we have reached out and done presentations for our people in the community is through our activities at our tribal center. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter where we highlight our history and our language for the our members and the public. Um, we have members only history and culture classes on the Tribal Center um, for our, our people. Some of those are occasionally for the public as well. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the website where we actually uh, anyone can go to and learn more about, you know, what we're doing, the scheduled events um, that people can attend. And of course, as I mentioned again, living reenactments in the reconstructed villages in Hillsboro and Pleasant Grove. Uh, cultural tourism is a big um, activity for us, and it's something that we're trying to cultivate and grow uh, and move forward with. And now at museums and other education institutions, we participate in a public events they may have. Uh, we volunteer and, and work closely with them in cooperation. Uh, there have been special exhibits which we have participated in, and our craftsmen and artists have, have done you know, displays there and interpretations. Uh, uh, the Orange County Museum actually recently had a, uh, during COVID, they did a, a presentation, which I'll talk about more on another slide, where they had an opportunity, people could each go online and learn about the Okanichi. We had panels which were professionally done, talking about our history. Uh, they have artifacts there, and they actually were allowing people to make, um, once things started to get improved, you could actually make appointments and go in uh, for a personal um, view of the exhibit. Um, other fun things we do is um, we're, we're uh, and this is something I, I, I'm a, a storyteller. Or I tell lies, as they say in the community, I'm a liar. <laughs> so we do a lot of and, you know, one of the things I like to do is tell ghost stories, you know, and I try, try to tell traditional ghost stories from the native communities in my community. So and we have different events like we're going to be doing one in Hillsboro uh, bonfire. We're going to be doing some traditional ghost stories from our communities there uh, sometime in the next few weeks, actually. 
Um, but one of the things that they've done in, in Hillsboro, they have haunted ghost tours and um, haunted histories. And myself and other members, we dress as historic members. I've played Eno Will a couple of times and I do an interpretation and give a you know little ghosty tale to, to make up in a regalia, period clothing. So it's kind of fun. So we try to make it fun and educational to get people involved uh, and, and, and to grow interest. Now, another venue we have utilized, I think is really helpful, and I think other Native communities have and should do is utilizing um, uh, social media to educate and reach the public. Uh, some of the things we've done in cooperation with uh, the Orange County and Alamance County and Caswell is um, we, we have done historical presentations on Zoom, which are uh, on YouTube, which can be accessed publicly. Um, ghost stories, you know, um, uh, history of, and with the Orange County Museum and Alliance for Hillsboro. Uh, about two years ago, I did a series of historical presentations which are accessible online. And these are the uh, web addresses. We can learn about the Okanichi history and specific periods of time. And these these slides, by the way, will be shared so you don't have to, you can be able to access them later. So, and, 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 and see the websites. Um, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, we our our youth are very much involved. We've got some of our kids involved, and they they get a kick out of that. They can now push the tribe, and for our most recent powwow, they they had to like have step back a little bit. They were a little over anxious, but it's kind of great. You know, you try and find use the, the modern tools to involve everyone in the community, and being able to get the kids involved has been a real boost for us. Um, the North Carolina Museum of History they have a um, a lot of programs geared to the native tribes in North Carolina. Uh, and in uh, November, they're going to be doing a uh, American Indian Heritage Festival. And we've always have a always have a station there with other tribes where we're able to talk about our native food ways um, and both English and the language and also, you know, our history. Unfortunately, one of our elders, John Jeffries, passed away um, and he was a mainstay there. He used to do primitive weapons demonstration. He used to was an expert and making a traditional weapons and tools. So he's been a great loss and we're gonna miss him dearly. Um, museum exhibits, as I mentioned, the Orange County Museum. Uh, this is a link you should actually go to now and see uh, they videotaped the exhibits. You can actually take a look at that and learn more about our people. Um, let me talk about some of the lessons learned and shared. Um, positives. And working with um, the museums and education institutions uh, and the tribe itself, some of the things we learned is how to work cooperatively, which is very important. Um, for, for many years, uh, education institutions, uh, museums, they may have had a, a view of the Native people, which is more in the past, and not dealing with the living populations. And we've made it one of our goals to let folks know, yeah, we're still here. We're not living in 1680 or 1710. We're living the 21st century, but we honor our past and we want to share that. But we also want to make sure people know we're still here. So we've worked with them, established these relationships and worked cooperatively with them. And it's been very fruitful for us. Um, better understanding of the OBSN and the local non-tribal communities. In line with that, we have a better understanding and relationship with these folks, and they understand and feel comfortable with us. So we can work on different concerns and issues. And um, if certain things happen, for example, we had an instance, God, about a year ago, where um, some Native remains were being sold. And we were told by one of the museums, hey, you know, we found out about this. So we, we were able to step in and take action. So these type of things, they, they have... Oh, oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> better hurry. I, I mean, but so protecting such research documents support historical narrative, um, and we also make information more accessible. Um, some of the pitfalls, um, you know, that we've learned, identified, and worked to prevent is not making unsupportive assertions and assumptions. Um, not following the research. That's a big problem that a lot of folks have. They have a preconceived notion of where it's going and they try to build the evidence, the research to fit that. That's a big no-no. You've got to follow the evidence, follow the documentation and support it. Um, that's something we preach and have, have learned from. Um, also, not second-guessing historical informants. Um, and that's, if I have the time, 
I'll address that a little in a few minutes. But um, one of the things is some folks, you know, they they look at um, interviews or information from a different era from native informants. And unfortunately, some of their inherent biases may get involved and, and they dismiss it all right. Are they are they trying to reinterpret that? We look at that information, accept it as for what it is. You know, these people were talking, they gave their information. Why can't it be accepted? You know, is there is there less value in them because they're native? All right. Um, also, I just wanted to, one of the things I wanted to also share is concerns about oversharing. Um, we're very cognizant that sacred knowledge is sacred and should not be shared. There's certain things that you find in your research um, that we know about that we have that we know it's only going to stay with us and we're not going to share it publicly. Um, when you're doing research, some of the things that have been found have PI information, you know, and we don't want to share that private information publicly. Plus, there might be other purposes, you know, if a tribe is working for state or federal recognition or in active litigation, there might be documents, evidence, which they want to keep them themselves for using that. Um, in terms of sacred knowledge, as I mentioned, some knowledge should not be shared with the public and only tribally approved wisdom and knowledge should be shared. And to get that, you should approach the tribe or talk to the tribal elders or council to get that approval. Bilahu, thank you. <clears throat> As we can tell, our panelists have a wealth of knowledge, and they were only able to give us an overview of their work. We have about 23 minutes now. If you'd like to ask questions, um, please go ahead and, and pose them now. I also have some starter questions. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, some common thread I was sort of finding was um, that um, balance that you were talking about of sort of um, uh, the sacred nature and respecting the history of sites, um, but also the desire to educate um, and share that in the public. Um, so I wonder if uh, the panelists can just talk a little bit more about um, uh, both how tribes and sort of outside institutions um, can walk that sort of line uh, and that balance. Um, so places that might, um, like Indian schools have, um, you know, sort of a tragic story, but also um, want to move forward into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm allergic to something in here, so I'm not copy. Clearly, that's what has to happen moving forward, but there are no shortcuts to that. Um, to give you an example, in starting my own research started with uh, phone calls that came to me about mascot issues. The um, NCAA brought uh, William and Mary up on their use of feathers as a mascot. So uh, the dean, I was new here at that time, and the dean called me in and said, "Okay, Danielle, you're the head of the resource American Indian Resource Center. What should we do?" And that's not my decision. We have to contact tribal groups in this area. Um, and what? You know, I can go on about what they said. They said feathers are not a mascot. We don't want mascots, but feathers are not a mascot. And by the way, uh, thanks for calling. We haven't heard from William and Mary for two centuries. You're calling me about that. I mean, think about it. You had a friend, a really good friend for 40 years, and you not have not been in touch with that friend for 20 years, but you call and you say, oh, by the way, remember when we parked the car over there? Yeah, this... It was that kind of thing. So you have to establish relationships that are meaningful. They take time. There's no shortcut. You can have some kind of performative thing where people come in and, you know, let's take some pictures. Tribes came in into leadership for a charter day or they come in to Williamsburg. That does not constitute a, a sustainable relationship over time, especially when there's been so much of a rupture. And who has and, a, and another aspect of your question is who has the authoritative voice in a community to express the community? Like these guys know that. But I also find I, I meet with somebody and say, well, I know so and so, and they're a member of tribe. Well, let's ask them. No, 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 no. We have to go to tribal, uh, the governments, 
and the appointed individual, so they have the authoritative voice. It's, it's not a casual situation. So I know this sounds like a negative response, but people <coughs> has, have to understand it's a long-term process of building relationships, being secure with one another, being heard, and maybe uh, creating documents that are more formal, such as some kind of um, understanding, agreement of understanding of how will we move forward, and that we will meet regularly to discuss where we are, and let us define the issues that we might want to, to correct or address. And um, this just takes time, but you, you're right to ask that question. That's a great question. I don't know if you've got it. Sure. Um, so boarding schools, moving on is a tricky question. Um, us moving on is making sure that we don't repeat mistakes of the past. Make sure that we're able to exert yeah. our educational sovereignty in these schools that we, we can teach our own kids. Um, <clears throat> but we, we go so far and then we hear about the bodies, the, the graves. And at Riverside, there's a hill on the north end of campus that's got 15 unmarked graves. Mm -hmm. We want, to, we want to send them back to the tribe, but those records have been lost. So every day I go by that hill and saw those unmarked graves. So we can move on, but we got to make sure we take care of the ones in the past. And when we do send those bodies and bones back to the tribe, we celebrate that. That's us moving on. We celebrate things at home. So that's our way of moving on. If that answers your question. Thank you. Yes. So I have a question about. What will the Mary plans to do about the Brackerton? Like, I was a graduate student here back in the 80s and early 90s. We absolutely knew that that was the Brackerton, but I can never remember a single time that that building was ever open. I've never, ever seen the inside. And so, I guess, <laughs> what are the plans for this? And how do they? plan to actually integrate this into the larger campus culture work. To go back to the panel yesterday, I mean, students come here because they're looking for like, a, you know, colonial, this colonial fantasy land on some levels. And how do you overcome some of that while also marketing your, because markets itself. So how do you how do you overcome some of those forces? And are there any plans to even try to overcome? Like what what happens now with this research? Yeah, as I ended, I said it's kind of a work in progress. But from my perspective, with the administration, there are a couple things that have to happen. And um, this is, of course, my view. I want to be clear about this. With that, I'll use a, a word, a strong word, rupture of indigenous people, not just from the Bradford Indian School, but from Virginia over time. So that 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 rupture, I don't say healed is a strong word. That has to be dealt with. I the words that I've used, native people need to feel comfortable coming onto our campus. But mm -hmm. so we have to move on multiple fronts. So I work with the administration on way, ways to do that. The president has, uh, President Rose established an office of strategic partnerships. At least that's a start. Um, but getting the, the history and hearing the voices, it's just, it's just gonna take time. What action has been taken? We now have a native studies minor that I am the director of. This maybe sounds like a small step. It's an interdisciplinary minor, but it's not a small step. We. And my capacity as curator of Native American art, my job is to build our collection of Native art. And that I, I am really looking towards contemporary works for just what these gentlemen have said. They're not prisoners of the past. They live in the present. And while we are very fascinated with the past in Williamsburg and a number of institutions that are adjacent to the to the university, we can't lock Native people in the past. That's not what I hear that they want. They want an acknowledgement of this shared history, acknowledgement of some very difficult things, but acknowledgement that they live today. And many of the communities today are impatient 
I would say with your very important question of what's going on. And meanwhile, they're moving ahead on other things, environmental issues, mm -hmm. reestablishing government and funding. They're, they're less interested in, okay, we're going to go over the, the 18th century again. Let, let, you know, you never get it right over here. Let's put more on it. So establishing sustainable relationships will take to the other woman's point will take a long time. Are there scholarships for uh, tribal groups in Virginia? I've been asking for more than 20 years, but because we're a public institution, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. This is a known request. We, we don't have targeted scholarships, at least I'm told that we cannot. So having the Native Studies minor may be a way to say, that can I raise funds for Native Studies? I now have an endowment for Native Studies that is for me to purchase and build the art collection. So a, a family has given me an endowment to work with. Um, that's part of maybe her question. We need to move on those fronts. But there, the university has, as you may imagine, numerous priorities. So any issue, you're kind of finding your spot to work in that space. We're not the only space. Native issues, unfortunately, are not the only space today. Um, I have a quick question. So I'm at the Kentucky in terms of American Association, which we have no state or federally recognized tribes, but there is a large Native American population, about 250,000 people, according to the census in Kentucky, recognize themselves as indigenous. How do you go about making connections as an institution with these non-recognized federally or recognized state tribal people who deserve to be recognized, but federally nor state have trust with either of those things because they've never been recognized. So my advice on the first topic is to uh, some of those tribes that are unrecognized, you have to really vet them to make sure they're who they say they are. There's been a lot of people that say they are, they're not, they're not related to anybody you try. And uh, some of those try, the people like that are what we call the pretendians, pretendians, because they claim it, but they don't know the culture. They just say they are. And sometimes they're a corporation with their volunteers. So I really vet the people, but if I were you, I'd reach out to the state department head and see if they have a state director, the education director first, and see if. But those groups are legit. Sometimes you get those big groups, they'll sort of lead you around the wrong way. And that's just me speaking on that part. So yes, sure. I I I know in North Carolina, uh we have the uh, North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs, state agency. Maybe uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not all familiar with Kentucky and you know, politics, what's going on there, but it seems that it's a, such a large population, it might be worthwhile. Exploring the possibilities, there is some way that the state could acknowledge and address these communities. I mean, have someone do a survey or research to determine are there communities in Kentucky that are indigenous to Kentucky, and if there are migrants from other tribes, where are they? Who are these people? There's ways it can be done, but it's one of the states take the initiative and the planning and reach out and find who are the leaders of these communities and establish some kind of ties with them. But it um, seems like such a large population could be done, um, but there has to be a will to do it. I'd like to add something, two points that may sound contradictory. Firstly, I can't imagine there's any space in North America that doesn't have some remnant population of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. That may be one thing. But I'll, I'll use College of William and Mary because this comes up. A group will come up and say, well, we're now newly organized. We're this tribe. What is author? I use specifically use the term authoritative voice. We as an institution are not a, a, an institution that um, is a formal method of acknowledgement of indigeneity of any kind of tribal whatever so we work in the space of state and federal government 
And as these gentlemen have said, you know, our federal tribes, well, over 574 federal tribes, you can get a list of all those. You can look at the National Congress of American Indians org. <clears throat> it's a great booklet, very reasonably, um, pardon me, reasonably easy to read, Indians 101. I have my students look at that. Um, then there are state tribes. It's, it's your state. You can't, Kentucky was full of native people originally. The archaeological remains are there. So that's a different kind of history of the displacement of native people. It's complicated, the things that we're talking about today. So how do you amplify voice that's often even been mixed up and tribes moved away? Virginia has gone through this until recently, as, as you know specifically, Lawrence. Getting federal recognition is fairly recent in Virginia. But this is a difficult question, and these guys are right. You have to go to the state authorities. You see somebody that how, how are we, what is the process of acknowledging who is legitimate? And it doesn't mean Native people who come forward don't have Indian ancestry. We're talking about tribal governments and tribal communities as, as institutionally our safe place to work with, legitimacy. So that's that's a decision of where do we cast that net? Otherwise, it, we don't really know who we're dealing with. And other tribes are very sensitive to this issue, very sensitive. So after this, we can help you out. We can kind of dive into the conflict. Okay. Maybe the University of Kentucky has someone as a scholar. It, my, university. My, some universities have these Native Nations Institute, so that's a great place to reach out for. I'm curious, um, you know, Kelly, you had mentioned that boarding schools and the history, the sad history, um, but we should be talking about them. We should be making sure to privilege Indigenous voices when we talk about them. Many of us, I'm going to make assumptions here, um, probably speak to public audiences or we speak to children. Um, we're we're in, in different institutions um, where we could be making this in. around that's going to guide you we're not going to say no because we want our culture in the classroom to be told truthfully so i would start there i tell my teachers if you don't want to listen to me reach out to somebody else because the tribe will help you. and every tribe has a liaison or should have a liaison with the local school community somewhere somebody will tell you this is how to teach it or if i can't tell you this i'll go find an elder and teach you so i bring a lot of elders into my classroom because they'll tell the stories, the creation stories of our tribe, whereas I can't tell that story today. So, but reach out, reach out to us, reach out to Nick for We're here to help. That's what I do. Mean, like, is to just work in the work community as much as you can. Yeah. And along with the line that Kelly was saying in North Carolina, I know that one of the things we found early on uh, was there was a dearth of information. Sure, you could look up, you can read about the historic Okanichi or the Nino and Shikori, but there is no tie to the modern descendants of these communities. So we made it a priority to establish relationships with the education institutions in the state, the county, uh, to find ways to educate them, to create those materials, to have opportunities to have speak, guest speakers go in to classes and talk about the tribe and our history. And our relationship both in the present and the past, which is really important because so many times, you know, we want to honor our past and our elders, but we're living now. And we need to be able to show that bridge, that connection, the, the, the ongoing heritage from ancient times to the present and going into the future. And so, yeah, I, you just got to contact the tribe uh, in, your, in your area and um, that they will find ways to network with the local institutions to, to either create those materials or find ways to get access to them.
I'm seeing a connection with last night's panel. Reach out to community. It's uh, about kind of writing down it. I want to. I want to give. I respect these guys, and I want to give an opposite point of view. Why? Approaching November, Native American Aid has already started. Emails, phone calls to me. Can I please bring someone to the classroom around the state? Other institutions. Can I speak? Can I speak here? The military professor. Can you send somebody to this unit in Norfolk? I've gone to the tribes in Virginia. Now that they are federally recognized, they're working on other things. And I get back to it, Danielle. We are like. You do it. No, I, I, I can't do it. I'm not representing you. So there is a problem. Mm -hmm. There is such a, an outcry for authentic voice in the classroom. So this is a big challenge. And in the state, like this woman mentioned Kentucky, who, who is she going to call? So I usually refer teachers back to standards, wherever they're calling from, their state standards of learning, their national standards of learning. Refer to your standards of learning. Go to the Department of Education where you live, and that would be Richmond. Richmond's, we've had lots of conversations with them. You probably even were part of that with our, um, the, the, the Council on <laughs> Indians. Um, <clears throat> to say this is an area that needs attention. Tribes just can't keep it, and, and it's if the schools want everybody to be professional Indian. Oh, the, you're supposed to stop work to go to this fourth grade class and take your vacation day. Think about it. And yet there is that need. You want to have their voice in the classroom, not, not mine. How do we do that? We have to think of ways of working with their communities to say, how can, we, how can we do this? What do you teach in grade four, in grade five, in grade 11? Where is there a space in your course on American government that in November, and not just November, it can include a component on indigenous government? It doesn't mean let's break out of the fourth grade rocks and sticks and let's really talk about native diplomacy during the American Revolution, American Indian involvement in World War I, in World War II. The American Indian movement in the 1970s, if you do it, the, the scientists, the contributions, that there are so many ways to bring indigenous perspectives into a curriculum that are outside of November and someone dressing up and bringing in arrowheads and pottery to the classroom. <laughs> when, as we hear, people are alive today. It's okay to do some of that. Or using native art. Images of artwork that is created to address some of these issues. So it's a lot of extra work for the teachers. I respect what you do, and you have a lot on your plate. I know that. But we've got to rethink the problem. Rethink it. So I'm not trying to say no to these guys, but my experience with Virginia isn't like that. One more question. Yes. So speaking in the vein of like relationship building and really like the presentation that you finish off with, um, a real problem I've seen in our society today is pointing towards authorities of like, oh, well, this, this is a federal law and I'm like a private institution. This does not apply to me. I've seen this in Northern California when I work at the Yurok and there's like a very kitschy um, roadside attraction, but really a museum that had inappropriate representation of objects. And so really, and local involvement and, and like regional kind of like what you talked about. I guess my question is, what are some really good um, like conversation starting points and trying to open up that dialogue of like, hey, like we have native communities here. How can we kind of change the like how we're depicted in the dialogue in these spaces? Well, the, the most important thing to me is you got to talk to the community first before you do anything. See if they're interested in doing that. They may have other things on their agenda, priorities, but you want to work with them and concert with them. And once you get the buy-in from the community, then you work with them and figure out how to do the approach, how to uh, make it so that, you know, like we have done, we try, sure, you're going to step on people's toes sometimes, but if something's wrong, you have to address it. But you have to find the right way to do it. And there's a, there's a wrong way and a right way. You just have to figure that out. And that's that comes from, like Danielle was saying, long-term working with folks, getting to know them interacting with them, getting to know the law, 
and how it applies in your jurisdiction. And know that if people are recalcitrant and don't want to work with you, that there's something you know, there is a price to pay. You know, you know, you can be, you know, you give them a little honey, but you get that vinegar sitting there mm -hmm. too. But the key is to work with the local community, native community, um, be it a tribe or a community or uh, an Indian commission, and you know, find out if they may already have these things they're working on. You just, you know, you're not gonna know that until you talk to them. Please join me in thanking our panelists for such a wonderful platform.